we have our fourth honorary degree recipient and our keynote speaker. Um, and I would like to confer the last honorary degree on Dr. Gerald Dees. College is pleased to celebrate Dr. Gerald Dees' numerous achievements and to confer upon Gerald Dees the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters on Oris Casa. Dr. Dees truly embodies an important MCNY ideal, effective advocacy to improve the community. After an impressive series of academic accomplishments that gave him an unusually broad perspective in public health, he went into teaching on the medical faculty of Downstate Medical Center, worked as a community activist to support churches in their health ministry, and launched the successful campaign to eradicate laundry starch-associated anemia among impoverished African-American women. He has campaigned to reach people through mass media, from TV to websites, and use poetry and songs to get his message out, including such crowd pleasers as oral obesity, sodium confesses, and my favorite, mean Mr. Nicotine. <laughs> in recognition of the energy, creativity, and effectiveness of Dr. Dees' activities in public health, we're pleased to award him this Doctor of Humane Letters. And I should add, Dr. Dees told me today that he practiced medicine, he practiced community medicine going on house visits, uh, working out of an apartment above his practice, having people come to him day and night for 40 years. And uh, he's uh, recently retired from that. He's moved into an apartment. He said he had to move to an apartment so people wouldn't be knocking on the door at every hour of the night. But he says the phone calls still haven't stopped coming. So he's still, still out there. Dr. Dees. Thank you so much for allowing me to enter this hallowed hall of the graduates of this wonderful college. Before I get started, and I'll be very short too, will all the grandparents of the students stand up, please, of the students that are graduating today? All grandparents, stand up. Any grandparents? Any grandparents? Any grandparents? Thank you so much. How about the parents? Parents of the students here today. Stand up. Give them applause. Parents. And last but not least, how many children are here today of the parents? <laughs> You can imagine, all of you sitting here today, of the studies that have took place in your homes, libraries. I want to thank Dr. Thompson, or President Thompson, Dr. President Thompson, of the School of Hope and Success for inviting me to, to be a teacher today for a few moments. I want to thank Ms. Didi uh, Letcher for her warmth, guidance, and Dr. Melvin Douglas, who's in our audience, who I have been a mentor for many years, and he himself has many degrees and has now been on the board here. Um, Melvin Douglas, will you stand, please? Thank you. All right, Melvin Douglas. Before giving you a few words, let me pay homage to those who made it possible for me to receive academic hoods at other universities. I would like to mention especially a Reverend Carpenter, who was a minister at a little church at the University of Michigan where I attended. He once stated in his sermon that he didn't have a BA degree, a PhD, or any other academic degrees. He only had one degree, and that's a BS degree, and I was born and saved.
And I grant you, of all the degrees you get today, and you get in life, there's one that will be the most for eternity, but will be born and saved. This degree will last forever. I recall a song by Duke Ellington entitled, It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing. To paraphrase, it won't mean a thing if the hood that our students are receiving today does not change the hoods that they are living in today, nothing will change. I brought along with me another type of hood. That will make the difference. I'm gonna bring it up. Um, this is Dr. one hood. Dr. D, so sit down here. This is one hood that I received in, of many hoods. But let me say that the hood that's gonna have to change if we're gonna make a difference is this hood. No matter how many hoods you get. <laughs> you don't change that hood, there will be no neighborhood. No matter what you have. No many, how many material you gain, cars, homes, the hood will be not a place that you will be staying in and living in. Because things are changing drastically and very fast. And so we must pay more attention to these hoods. And I look at them sometime, and I say to myself as I look at the young people, religion is gone, churches are becoming theaters rather than places of worship and so forth. We have to make great changes, folks if we're going to make a change in our communities. Let me say that this reminds me of a short story uh, about a chicken and a pig <laughs> walking down a road one day. They came upon a house where our family was eating a morsel of bread. And the chicken said to the pig, you know, Mr. Pig, uh, next week we're going to come by this house and we're going to give this home and family in here the best meal they ever had of eggs and ham. <laughs> and the pig looked at the chicken and said, wait a minute, all you're going to have to do is make a contribution, but I'm going to have to make a commitment. <laughs> he said, because when I fry, when I, have, I have to die to get that ham and that red bacon. All you're going to do is make that contribution. Folks, we're making just too many contributions, but not making commitments. Commitments! We're not paying attention to vows. We take vows. We're not taking vows seriously, even in marriage. And all the things that have happened on the internet and all the things that have taken place. How could we feel great today that our humanity is surviving? With all the things that are happening to our families and to our friends and just dastardly acts of things going on. It has been said that when we get to heaven, God will not count the medals on your chest. He'll count the stars. He'll count the stars. It is evident to earn a star, but you must be wounded with many disappointments. Before I continue about life stars, let me just take a moment of the scars that are produced by guns in our neighborhood. I would like everyone in this audience to bow their heads in memory of all the young folks who are dying in our streets. I have seen too many lives ruined when he admitted to Kings County Hospital. Just take a moment and just ask God to change the attitude of our young people. You know, it's not aptitude, it's attitude that gives you altitude. We have to take this thing very so seriously because these robes and things mean nothing. 
your homes and all the things we work for so hard, uh, it means nothing if we don't have a happy youngster and so forth. I'm at Brown State Medical Center. We formed an organization called DAM, Doctors Against Murder. And we go out to the high schools and talk about the, the guns and things like this. I would say to everyone sitting here, if you know anyone who has a gun, or if you have a gun in your home, I would suggest you take that gun next week, go to your precinct, drop it off, and no questions will be asked. Because that gun is not to hurt somebody else, but it might just hurt you and somebody in your family. Because you don't know how many people I had to go to see with gunshot wounds from a family member who got irate over some silly, foolish, foolishness and thing and kill a whole family. How can we be here today and, and be happy with the fact that we're getting more gowns? You have to get less hoods. I personally have witnessed scars of slavery of my great grandparents who arrived in Charleston, South Carolina. In 1769, they came. Not long ago, they were in the shackles, worked for no pay. You're sitting here today with gowns on over there for their bodies. How would they feel proud of you after doing all what they had to, had to do in life? You see, because these shackles were on their wrists. And let me tell you about these shackles. When they were transported as slaves, they were in complete darkness for weeks. They had to live and with their, their bowel movements. They had to smell all those things. They died there. And I tell the young people, and I tell you, if they survived in three feet, six inches, why can't you survive in all this space? Free school, housing, a place to sleep in. When you go home tonight, you have a bed to sleep in? Think of them. Not too long ago. They had this. Do you know what you got now? Here's what they're doing to us now. On the brain. Shackles on the brain. Not easy to remove. Not easy to remove. Because once you get those shackles on the brain, and you're trying to remove those shackles now, that's why you're sitting up to here today. Because you got those shackles off that brain. And that's going to make the difference in the communities. All you ladies and uh, uh, gentlemen and uh, young boys and girls in this community here. Wrote a poem not too long ago called Everybody is Somebody. But I go around the schools. I spend more time in schools. I practiced medicine for over 42 years, but I practiced in Queens in my home. And uh, for 42 years, I was on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, six, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, because I lived right there. I lived in, the, in my home where I practiced medicine. And my wife who's here today, she stood by my side before I got into medicine and afterward. My wife, Stan, please. Fifty-four years. Fifty-four years of marriage. That's a commitment. That's a vow to you folks out there. You young men with those wives. You kind of took a vow. You're not paying attention to those vows. Things can be rough sometimes, but you still made a vow. You can't break them that easy. I mean, you make that vow in front of God. That's, that's a vow. That's, that's a promise that you will do right by each other. By each other. The poem's called Everybody is Somebody. And it says, first, you've got to walk like somebody. 
Then you got to talk like somebody. Then you got to act like somebody going somewhere. You got to smile like somebody, act like a child or somebody. And let everybody know that you can. And even a mouse became somebody. He has frightened everybody. Because he refused to think that he was small. He decided in his mind that he was one of a kind, and from that day he's been ten feet tall. First you gotta walk like somebody, then you gotta talk like somebody. Then you gotta act like somebody going somewhere, you gotta smile like somebody, act like a child or somebody, and let everybody know that you care. And even a roach became somebody. He's been sprayed by everybody. Because he refused to stay in the wall. He was tired of dirty places and undesirable spaces, and now he lives in the kitchen and the hall. First you gotta walk like somebody, then you gotta talk like somebody. You gotta act like somebody going somewhere. You gotta smile like somebody. Act like a child or somebody. But let me tell you about this, brother. Show just you about these shackles. They even have shackles for children. I have them up here also. Where could a child go with these? Where could a child go with these? I had a young lady come to my office the other day, Downstate Medical Center, where I've been there for 54 years. Went to medical school there in 1958, two blacks in my class. Two black males, myself and a young man from Aruba, Phi Beta Kappa from Howard University. 50 years later, 50 years later, you're lucky you can get 10 black males in medical school. You worried about your medical care? You look for a doctor at night. You look for a doctor to come to your home. You go to the emergency room. Serious stuff is going on. Old people, when I made house calls, old people laying there and they haven't seen a doctor. Months. And I had to go to those homes all through South Jamaica, all, all over the place. Did anybody call? I made a house call. Because a house call was a call for help. And you see, in some of the houses I went into, it was desperate. Desperate old people not getting even hear these old people marched on those lines. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all of those people who stood up for us. You can't get a doctor, a black doctor, to come into a house to make a house call. Think of that. They got their gowns, they got their all the things in life that are pleasant. Every night I say my prayers at night, I just think of how many people. Don't go to bed at night. How many people don't go to bed? Let me tell you something. Listen to this. If we could shrink the Earth's population to the size of a village of precisely 100 people and retain all the existing human ratios of the world, this is what the village would look like. 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 people from North and South America, 8 Africans, 52 females and 48 males, 70 non-whites and 30 whites, 70 non-Christians and 30 Christians, 93 heterosexuals and 7 homosexuals, 6 possess 59, 6, 6 would possess 59% of the entire world wealth, and all of them are from the United States. 80 live in substandard housing, 70 are unable to read, 50 suffer from malnutrition, one is near death, one is giving birth, one has a college education, and one owns a computer. When you consider the world from such a compressed perspective, the need for acceptance, understanding, and education becomes glaringly apparent. Think of this. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than a million people who will not survive this week. That's the God. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, of loneliness, imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. If you can attend a church meeting without a fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than 3 billion people in the world. If you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep peacefully, you are richer than 75% of the world. If you have money in the bank and in your wallet and some change on the dish by your bed, you are among the 8% of the world's wealthy. And if your parents are alive and still married, you are very rare, even in the United States, if you can't 
if you can read and you have more blessed, you are more blessed than two billion people in the world who have who are illiterate. You are blessed with your robes on and everything else. If you don't think with those robes that that's is for your betterment, you have wasted your time. You're wasting your time. I was talking to this one of the doctors here in humanities. He said that's what they do in your school. They give you humanity. And that's the thing that's so wonderful about this school. Uh, I wish I had a school to go to. I wish I wasn't two of blacks in a, a school. I wanted to be embraced. But I had to be on my own because I became president of the class for four years at Dallas State Medical College. In closing, let me just say this. And just to bring your consciousness. Recently, I monumented a African young lady who has a 15-year-old daughter, and she's 42 years old. And she wanted to go to medical school. And she came to me when I went to her. Wonderful marks in school now, wonderful marks. She applied to Down State, she applied to University of Syracuse, she to Albany State Medical School. Has a 15-year-old daughter, and she didn't know what she to do. So I told her I'd try to get her into Med Dallas State Medical College. It didn't happen. But she got into, she's 42 years old now. She got into Albany State Medical School and Syracuse University Medical School at 42 as a 15-year-old daughter. Now, just think of that. She has been admitted to medical school at Albany State Medical College. She also was admitted to Syracuse Medical School. When she finishes training, she will be 46 years old. 46 years old just to finish medical school. And when she finishes training, her daughter will be 19 years old. She will then have to pass many exams and take a four-year residency that is in medicine, surgery, and so forth. And, 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 and a four-year family practice residency, and it will make her 50 years old going into medicine, to practice medicine. Here, this young lady, she can speak Chinese, a uh, ma magnificent person. Here's someone from really good, and no one wants to go back to Africa and take care of her people. That's why you want to get down. In closing, let me just say this. I had to make a decision a long time ago of being your own man. You owe this to the survival of our people. Seriously. It's happening every day. The gunshot wounds. You, you can't imagine 17 people last week had shot, shotgun wounds in, in, uh, in Queens. 17 people. Girl was hit with bullets on a boardwalk, walking on a boardwalk. Mining along the gunshot. What is going on? What's going on, black man? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? When things happen like that in my neighborhood, my father and his guys got in their cars and they went on and arrested certain people and took them to the precinct. They didn't beat them, do nothing else, just take them to the precinct, had them in a lineup that they were disturbing the neighborhood. And they couldn't trust their children to go and play in the park and things like that. But at where I put man in my poem, I want women to say the same thing. It says, I want to be my own man. Don't want to be a lone man. Can't stand the growing a man when I'm knocking on his door. I've been through hell, my friend. Never knew there was an end. That's why I could always grin getting up off the floor. Now I'm not asking for your share. You don't even have to say you can. Just put the opportunity there and I'll even up the score. Because I gotta be my own man, gotta follow my own plan. And if you care, you'll give a damn by healing up the soul. So come on and walk with me. Come on and talk with me. Tell me how it feels to be free, even if you're poor. Got to be my own man, got to build with my own hands. So we call this our land and live together the more. Thank you.